Good afternoon. I always hate to come like interrupt uh, um, lively conversations that have been uh, instilled by what I thought was a very um, uh, inspiring lunch. I also understand that you've had a very inspiring morning. Um, so now it is upon uh, me, but much more uh, on my uh, distinguished um, uh, panelist here and keynote speaker to make sure that the um, afternoon session doesn't make you forget the morning session, but uh, does um, does stand uh, in and on itself uh, in its own own right. So I have here, and um, I will not go through all the CVs. You can see them or you know them. And if you don't, uh, I'm sure there is material that, uh, that, uh, that, that helps. Um, so I'll just uh, mention the names next to me, uh, Beata Javorczyk of the uh, EBRD, who will be uh, giving uh, in a minute um, a, um, a, a keynote. Um, then um, we have um, Evailo Isforsky of the World Bank, um, um, Anita Angelovska Bezoska of the uh, National uh, Bank of the Republic of North Macedonia. We have uh, Boris Fujis of the uh, Croatian Central Bank and uh, Jen Tseko of the Bank of Albania. So this, this, this session um, will try to take a little bit of a longer term, longer term view. Um, so I'll just throw some questions at you that um, might, uh, might one way or the other be addressed uh, this, uh, this afternoon or might inspire you uh, later to ask questions. Uh, and now that I'm at there, there will be a Q&A session. This is off the record. Um, and also those who are um, um, sitting in the back uh, without their own microphone, there are microphones available. So don't be shy uh, and participate later in the, uh, the Q&A. Um, so uh, in the medium to long term, just some questions that uh, we might reflect on. Uh, to what extent will the changing geopolit uh, geopolitical landscape impact economic convergence? What are the implications for energy, for the energy and the green transition? What are the risks of economic fragmentation, potentially affecting trade and uh, foreign direct investment flows as well as global and regional value change? Um, could the, um, the, the, the region benefit from nearshoring? Uh, what are the economic implications of refugee flows uh, from the Ukraine? How may the changing geopolitical environment affect EU governance and the prospect of EU enlargement? Um, I have many more questions. I will not uh, go through all of them now. It was just kind of like as a very short appetizer. Uh, and uh, Beata, I would uh, kindly invite you to take the floor. And, and you have uh, 20 uh, or so minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me here. It's a pleasure to be joining you today and to talk about globalization in turbulence and what it means for the CZ region, as we affectionately um, call it. This morning, we talked about fragmentation making the lives of central bankers more difficult. And, and in some ways, the, the tone of the morning session was um, not particularly optimistic. So I would like to take my 20 minutes and you know, spend the first half of them talking about the opportunities. It's the changes we see in international trade patterns may bring uh, to the CZ region. And then I want to take a step back and come back to some of the themes that appeared this morning and ask what are the constraints that may prevent countries in the region from taking advantage of these opportunities and how um, they could potentially. And I, I hope that you know, the discussion that will follow will address um, the solutions, how these constraints could potentially be addressed. <clears throat> so um, what we've already heard this morning is echoed here supply chain disruptions have become a key concern for global firms here you see um, what firms talk about when they announce their quarterly earning calls um, when they announce their quarterly earnings in calls with analysts um, what kind of factors they mentioned as a source of risk so not surprisingly COVID was the major uh, factor then war and prices of natural gas mattered very much. Environment continues to be a big source of risk in perceptions of firms, but sup and supply chains are still there. Right. So even though um, they declined in relative importance, it is still something that is a source of risk. 
Now, this is not surprising because over the last few years, we've seen a series of disruptions. You may still recall the Fukushima earthquake that cut off Japanese companies um, all over the world from their suppliers in Japan. Then, of course, the US-China trade war started and those tariffs are still in place and the war uh, continues. COVID, of course, um, blockage of Suez Canal for about a week. Uh, that caused a lot of disruption to international trade flows. China zero COVID policy further exacerbate disruptions and then the war. And I'm going to argue that the war has changed the mindset of firms. We have been talking about reshaping of global value chains ever since the beginning of the COVID pandemic, but the war, I believe, was a trigger that, that started off the process of reshaping of supply chains. And that's because firms suddenly realized that geopolitical risks are not going away anytime soon. And they realized that the cost of inaction is greater than the cost of doing something. Until the war started, nobody wanted to do much simply because supply chains have been optimized from the cost perspective and doing something meant higher cost. Now, how do I know that something is happening? Well, in our transition, in our latest transition report, we looked at, we asked firms. So on the right hand side, you see a survey of 3000 manufacturing firms from Germany. This is a survey we did together with the IFO Institute from Munich. This is a representative survey of German manufacturing firms where they were asked about concrete steps they have taken to address resilience of their supply chains. And you see that two thirds of German firms reported having added new suppliers. That contrasts very much with what they were reporting um, two years ago, where they only reported having vague plans to do something. Now, what you also see, this is the top chart is two thirds of German firms increase their inventories. So essentially we see a movement from just in time to just in case. Not surprisingly, larger firms tend to adjust by adding new suppliers, smaller firms adjust more on the inventory side. I've looked at data from the US firms from the US sourcing from China, we also see some movement there, firms sourcing from more um, countries. Now, on the left hand side, you see um, the results of the survey of the same survey or similar survey done in emerging Europe among nine, almost 900 firms that export and import. And the picture is very much similar. Firms are adjusting. Now, what you don't see is what politicians were hoping for, reshoring. So basically, you don't see much evidence of firms bringing production back into in-house. You don't see very much firms bringing production to their country and uh, dropping foreign suppliers, replacing them with, with domestic supplier. Rather, what seems to be happening is this China plus one policy. Right? And if it's China plus one, then the question is who will become the plus one? And here, what's quite revealing is the perceptions of German firms vis-a-vis um, -vis suppliers located in broadly defined European neighborhood. And this is what actually makes me optimistic about the process from the perspective of the uh, CZ region. You see that Firms in Germany consider as the most reliable German suppliers, followed by suppliers from Western Europe, other Western European countries, followed by essentially NAFTA, so US, Canada, Mexico. But then very closely after that, you see uh, Poland, Hungary, Czech Republic, and Slovakia, followed by Romania, Bulgaria, Croatia, and then Western Balkans and Turkey, and then North Africa. And um, all of these, this group of countries, they are viewed much more favorably than Southeast Asia and way more favorably um, than China. 
And if you look at what German firms import from China, um, to a large extent, it matches comparative advantage um, of countries in this broadly defined European neighborhood. So there is actually a real possibility of firms in the CZ region replacing some of the um, imports from China. And, you know, I hope that during the discussion we can talk about what would it take to seize these opportunities. One of the theme is certainly um, attracting more foreign direct investment. Because what we know from international experience is that if you want to not only export products you are already exporting, but you want to start exporting new products, products that you were not selling before, bringing a large multinational, social, multinational producer tends to be the most effective way of doing that. And we know globally that these multinationals tend to be responsible for majority of what we call export recover discoveries. Okay. Um, and, you know, emerging Europe is very well integrated in global value chains. We've, saw, we've seen some charts this morning. Um, many countries are actually more integrated in global supply chains than the average level of integration found in advanced uh, economies. So this is the first opportunity for the region. Now, the title of this conference uh, involves the word geopolitics. So let me bring more politics um, here. The war. The war has led to big changes in international trade patterns and I'm going to highlight just one um, as um, we are focusing on a particular region. Now if you look at the left hand side chart you see that exports from Europe, so this is EU plus the UK, exports to Russia dropped dramatically and because you want to it matters what has been happening with exports in general with global demand as we go through turbulent times. Here, what you see is exports to Russia relative to European export to the world. So essentially, very large decline, not only in absolute terms, but also sort of relative to European exports to the world. At the same time, you see exports from Turkey to Russia going up relative to Turkish exports to the world. And the red line here is the beginning of the war and beginning of the sanctions. So essentially what we see is as the West stops supplying Russia, this created an opportunity for other countries to, to step in. Um, and Turkey is one of the countries that took advantage of this opportunity. Um, if you look at, for instance, Chinese exports, you also see that Chinese exports are replacing some of the flows that are not happening, uh, that are not coming from Europe. Now, early during the, um, at the beginning of the war, we heard concerns about um, reshipments of products taking place via Turkey actually um, that 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 uh, there were some reasons to 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 believe that but actually a lot of this trade seems to be turkish own production so a lot of it seems to be uh, plain old trade diversion the third the third um issue i want to highlight is business services right so we tend to obsess with trade in goods but actually services create a great export of services is a great not yet fully explored opportunity uh, in the region. Now, when you talk to people who are involved in what they call managed services, so a lot of it is back office services, they claim that uh, there are about 5 million workplaces um, in Central Europe in, in that branch. I think we are going to see more. Well, once we crossed the psychological threshold of moving to remote work or hybrid work, which is where we are, 
why would a firm from Munich on, or from Frankfurt limit itself to workers in their own city or even in their own country, right? Once we are working in a hybrid mode, you can equally well hire somebody from Poland or from Romania, right? There is actually the differential in pay is large. Um, there is no or little time differential. Um, within the EU, we have common data protection regime. That is incredibly important um, when data cross crosses the borders, particularly, especially in actually financial industry. Um, Schengen offers the opportunity to, you know, seamlessly commute to your workplace. Um, and there are two other factors um, that I think are quite underappreciated. One is very many firms are dependent on back office services um, coming from India and that also poses some risk of concentration. So you may want to diversify by tapping into the emerging uh, Europe and sourcing some services there, just in case should there be some shock that affects Bangalore or, or Pune. And second, the CO2 footprint, right? And I, I think if, you, if your institution um, Thus, a serious assessment of its CO2 footprint, um, often, you know, being in an efficient, well isolated building and, you know, having zero waste, as, as, as we have at EBRD, we are in a very green new building. The, the place where you will see your green, your CO2 footprint being larger is the services you buy goods and services you buy. So if you are flying your IT um, consultants and your systems support people from India, that's, that's a high CO2 footprint. While you can get somebody from Slovakia uh, commuting by train. And I think that's something firms are going to increasingly pay at attention to. So now what are the reasons, what are the potential constraints to this you know, somewhat optimistic scenario I, I outlined. Well, one, of course, is adverse demography. And we already um, discussed this a bit this morning. Um, countries in the CZ region are getting old before becoming rich, right? So they are experiencing demographic transition at the income level that is much lower than the income level at which advanced economies experience demographic transition. And this has many implications, but one of them is that it's going to be harder to export, ex export manufacturing goods because you need to have people to produce them. It's going to be harder to export services, business services, managed services, because essentially you're exporting uh, people. Um, but of course, the somewhat positive byproduct of the very um, difficult war, very negative shock has been for the recipient countries, the inflows of refugees, right? We, we, heard, ab about the, we heard about the other side this morning, about the negative impact it has on Ukraine, about the horrific impact it has on the lives of people. But in the short term, it may, the presence of refugees eases some of the constraint um, of the hot labor markets in the recipient countries. And, you know, what we've discussed this morning, how well Europe managed to integrate refugees into uh, the labor market. Um, you, you see here that there is a lot of differences in terms of the number of, of, of refugees uh, who, have, uh, who have been received by, um, by various countries. Um, the international experience tells us that some percentage of refugees will stay, some will go, hopefully with additional experience, with additional education they received uh, in the countries that are hosting them. Um, and I think 
they will become a bridge between Ukraine and the host countries, promoting trade and investment. That's what uh, academic literature tells us, that foreign-born individuals um, tend to help create commercial links be between countries. But some of them are bound to stay. Now, what's different about this wave of refugees that is this, these are primarily, men, uh, primarily women and children. So we are going to see flows in both directions, probably, as um, families will be reunited. Now, the, so, so this was the sort of the, the number of people, right? We're talking demographic trends, um, maybe some easing of constraints through refugees. So you see, you know, green and red, as in sort of uh, green light and red light. Now, what is positive is if you look at the new EU member states, if you think about, you know, what kind of workforce these countries have, actually this workforce seems to be pretty healthy. Um, these are the data from um, surveys um, where people are asked to assess their own health. And it, so on the left hand side, you see self as assessed health by men on the right hand side by women, and they are ordered by age cohort. And the picture is actually very optimistic because people in the new EU member states, both men and women tend to be at least in their own perceptions as healthy as as, as their counterparts um, in uh, G7 countries. Actually, if, if you look at older data, you see that the picture was, was actually less rosy, right? The, the particularly among older people, self-assessed health was less. But where we see red light flashing is um, EU candidate countries. So if you look at the result of the same poll, Gallup World Poll, looking at the EU candidate countries, so, um, you see that people in those places perceive themselves as much less healthy. And what's particularly worrisome is this drop off in quality of health as you age, right? So among, well, I shouldn't say as you, among older cohorts, right? That young people, both young men and women, more or less are as healthy as um, as people in G7 countries or the new EU member states, but the older cohorts view themselves as being in a much worse condition. And this drop-off is particularly pronounced for women. Older women uh, perceive themselves as much as healthy. And if you compare these figures to Emerging, country, emerging markets, essentially you see that EU candidate countries are on par with emerging markets. Here, emerging markets being defined as having income level of slightly above $1,000 per capita in PPE terms. Now, the, the next thing I want to look at is the labor force participation, right? So if, you know, if there are these great opportunities to export goods and services, and we don't have that many people, um, how well are we utilizing the endowment we have? And again, very optimistic picture from uh, the new EU member states, fairly very high labor force participation, um, you know, for both men on the left hand side, women, very comparable to G7 countries. But now look at the EU candidate countries, um, not huge differences for men, but on the right hand side, you see much lower labor force participation among women. Now, the final point I want to make is, well, we have these people, they are healthy or not, they participate in labor force or not. Well, what about their skills? And we heard skills mentioned this morning. On average, IT skills in emerging Europe are lower. And here um, you see a very simple statistic um, based on surveys. People were asked, have you purchased anything online? And on the horizontal axis, you see 
the share of people between ages, I believe, of uh, 15 and six and 670 who purchased something online in 2019. And on the vertical axis, you see the same figure for 2020, right? So we are talking about COVID time, people buying more online. Most of these dots lie above the uh, 45 degree line, not surprisingly, but the ranking of countries is preserved. So basically, um, countries where there was very little online shopping, they continue to do little of this. Now, I'm not taking a stand whether online shopping is a good or a bad thing, but it's a good proxy for IT skills. And you see the red dots at the top of the scale. Um, this is Great Britain, Netherlands, Sweden, Germany. Basically, 90% of people buy online. And then at the bottom here, you see Bulgaria, um, Bosnia and Herzegovina, um, and Montenegro. Right? Le about less than a third of people bought something online. Now, we were interested in understanding why people are not buying online. Um, at first, we thought it's payment. It's cons it's about payment terms, right? That people are worried about giving their credit card number, but or they don't have a credit card number. Uh, actually, that concern can be alleviated because you can pay on delivery. So when we started digging on this, for a lot of people, it was about skills. They say, I don't know how to do it. And what's particularly worrisome, and this is my last slide for the chair, is the lack of IT skills among older workers, so people between the ages of 55 and 74. The top dot you see in that little square is the share of people in that age group between 55 and 74 who bought something online in advanced Europe. That's about 70%. Then the next dot is pertains to the um, Eastern European member states. Um, that's about 30. And then at the very bottom, you see Western Balkans and Turkey, and that's actually um, about 15%. Right? So if we want people to work longer, we need to train them. And I think, you know, we talked about training this morning. When we think about training, we shouldn't only think about young people, but we need to think about how to keep older people working longer and in particular how to equip them with the IT skills that will allow them to um, cope with the changing um, environment. So thank you very much.